Good morning, SIGGRAPH 2021. I am Andres Burbano, the chair of the retrospective program. I'm here to introduce Dr. Ed Katmul and Dr. Pat Hanrahan, despite most of you knowing very well about the work of these two computer scientists. Ed Katmul is one of the founders of Pixar, was the president of Walt Disney Animation Studios, and is an expert on creativity. Pat Hanrahan is a Canon American professor at the Computer Sciences Department at Stanford University, was a founding employee at Pixar as well, and a founder of the Tableau data visualization software. In 2019, both were the recipients of the ACM Turing Award, the so-called Nobel Prize for Computer Sciences. The ACM statement was, for fundamental contributions to 3D computer graphics and the revolutionary impact of these techniques on computer generated imagery in filmmaking and other applications." End of quote. In my words, there are spirits able to see the, able to see the future. Those are visionaries. There are people who are able to go to the future. Those are pioneers. There are remarkable individuals who are able to see the future, to go there and open it up for an entire community. Those are world makers. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Kadmul and Pat Hanrahan are exactly those three things, visionaries, pioneers and world makers. And we have the privilege of listening to them in one of the most sophisticated form of interaction, which is a conversation. The moderator of the conversation is Don Greenberg, professor of computer, computer sciences at Cornell University. He flew from the East Coast to the West Coast to join the conversation in person. With no further ado, let's spark the creativity and ignite the flame of the conversation. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Andre. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm here with two of my closest and most respected friends with the interview or chat of the recipients of the Turing Award. Uh, I actually am, am so thrilled to be here and to have this opportunity. But I, I think that there are two ways to look at this award right now. Uh, the first uh, is of course that uh, between the two of them and uh, others who were early pioneers in this area, they've, we've finally been at the point, we are finally now at the point where they've legitimatized computer graphics for the computer science industry. And it's probably hard for today's youth to understand what it was like when we started in computer graphics early on and I wanted to take the liberty of about two minutes to explain what the field was like even before SIGGRAPH. But it's the legitimacy in computer science and the impact that it will have in the future, which may even be more important than what we have done now. And I'll be able to address some of these things as we start to go through our chat. Uh, I have to tell the SIGGRAPH community though, from my entire heart, that uh, SIGGRAPH is my academic home. I've been teaching for more than 50 years, but this is my academic home. And without SIGGRAPH, I don't think I would be in the teaching profession. So having said that, 
uh, how did how did we start and what was the environment just before SIGGRAPH? And if I could show two simple pictures. One, the first one, Pat's going to move because it's well, harder for me it. to get out. I think you have to get closer to the map. Okay, that is a picture of ferrite metal, uh, the iron cores actually, quarter inch diameter, uh, stores of a bit of information. And the first machine uh, that I was able to purchase uh, was $16,000 for 16,000 bits of information, bytes of information. as a thousand dollars a byte. And so it was so prohibitively expensive, it was a luxury. The other was these strange groups of people who got together very early on. Uh, our Bible was a, not a textbook, but the whole earth catalog by Stuart Brand in the 1970s, those people who were rebelling against typical types of teaching and new sciences that would emerge because of the computer industry. So it was very, very novel to be working in this area. And uh, it was almost impossible to understand uh, where groups came from because they came from every discipline. The points that I would like to make with respect to Ed and Pat are two things which you have said or done or both, which I think are really important for the future and we'll get into more detail about both of them. But when Pixar was found, was started, and even before Pixar was started, Ed, who had the only background of the three of us who was really a computer scientist and uh, wanted to do animation, uh, was in his own field. Uh, Pat was working on the, neuro, the neurology or the neuroscience system of a nematode. And I was in the architecture engineering world and uh, I don't know how we all merged into this same area. But what Ed did in the very beginning, he wanted to make sure that the scientists, the people who were doing coding in Pixar and the artists were peers, they were equals. And the importance of this was that uh, to quote C.P. Snow in his Reed Lecture of the Royal Society of England, when his literary friends tried to meet his scientific friends, he was able to say to some uh, degree that the scientists had the future in their bones and his literary friends were wishing that the future would go away. Ed, how did you manage <laughs> to put the artists and the computer scientists together so successfully over so many years? Well, the, the, uh, the first thing to note is that uh, I, I want to say something about the environment that I happen into. Um, and Pat and I both talked about the fact that we feel a little awkward because there's this recognition for what we did. But in, in fact, we are products of this rather rich world of, of we, we see it as SIGGRAPH, but it was broader than that. Um, and I, when I was in graduate school, ARPA was funding programs um, around the, uh, the, the US. Uh, and the premise of it was that they picked good leaders and there was very little bureaucracy. They created an environment for people to solve problems. So what I walked into had already been set up. Ivan Sullivan, Dave Evans were there. You were at Cornell. <laughs> but in this environment, um, the, we were trying to make better pictures. At that time, they were black and white or they were line drawings. <laughs> they were... Uh, they were crude, but we all knew they were crude. 
we also understood this principle of Moore's law, which was that over time things are going to get faster and faster. So let's solve the problems. And so here we were with with uh, you know, Dave and Ivan, and Ivan's one of the uh, the, the pioneers, the, the real pioneer in computer graphics. Uh, and he was head of that, uh, the IPTO program at ARPA uh, for a year, but they set up an environment. And that was my great teacher was that these students were coming from all over. Alan Kay was there, Jim Clark, um, uh, uh, John Warnock, uh, Frank Croce, a variety of people. And it was just all supportive. There were, we weren't competing with each other. We were friends. We were helping. And I remember thinking at the time, it was like, this is awesome. Can we keep doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and even and when I left to, and, to go off to New York Tech, um, the thought that I had at the time was, can we recreate that? And, and the answer is couldn't completely because it wasn't really the academic environment that we had there. But the principle I got was by working with that group of people. And it was, for me, is this wonderful experience and luck, frankly, that I was there at, at the time. And I'd originally wanted to be an animator, that I wanted to be a physicist. And when I took that first class in computer graphics by Ivan Sutherland, it's like, oh, we can put them together. They belong together. And that's been the premise all along. I said, is the different disciplines belong together. We are all contributors, doesn't matter where we come from. And if we can keep that kind of spirit uh, in place, then we'll, we'll, we'll move towards that barely understood future. Yeah, but you, it, you're expressing your hope when you talk that way. And you must have had problems in being able to do that at the time you were trying to get these two diverse groups to work together from the art side and the creative side and the computer science side. How were you able to manage that? You're one of the few people who have been able to do that, but that it's still almost impossible to do with the rare exceptions in the university today? Well, I, I, for me, I felt like I could observe what was going on. So I, I recognized, first of all, when I graduated, and I tried to get a job. So I just got my PhD and I told people what I thought was going to happen. And I did not get a single offer from any university, right? Because it was too bizarre. The fact that you would, you even think about trying to develop graphics to the point of making movies. And in fact, uh, computer graphics uh, was for some reason not considered a legitimate part of computer science. I remember going to a conference at the time, the Society of Information Display, and I overheard two people talking on, on the, this is in the, uh, uh, the, the, the exhibit, you know, where this different vendors are showing in. And, and I heard two people disparagingly talking about this out of uh, left field sort of crazy stuff they were doing at the University of Utah. This was at a display conference. And, and I, I, is this what they think? Now, I knew they were wrong. I didn't, it didn't make me feel bad. I thought, that's ignorant. They don't actually see it. And the irony was is that, that uh, Utah was one of the first four uh, uh, universities on ARPANET at the time, which meant that, that uh, ARPA believed that the ability to visualize stuff was going to be important for the future. So if ARPA was funding this to begin with, then why were so many people in the field of computer science thinking that computer graphics actually was a frivolous slideshow? So that was sort of like the basement that we were in to begin with, but I didn't feel bad. I was just like, it's just wrong. It was ignorant. Um, and then when I got to New York Tech, um, the, uh, uh, I was very fortunate because uh, uh, Alex Shore, who was the head of the school, was funding it. And Allie Ray Smith joined us at this time. And we had this actually remarkable group of people um, and with more equipment than anybody else at the time. But I do remember that 
Alex was telling the artists that when the technical guys were successful, they wouldn't need the artists anymore. So it's like, oh my God, <laughs> don't say that. It's not true. <laughs> and, and then uh, as, as we moved on, uh, uh, Disney tried to bring in some technology early on, but it was very clear when you talk with the people that the, um, the technical people were considered second class. And if you were to talk with them, they felt second class. And if you were to talk with the artist, then they would, they wouldn't, nobody was using the, the class terminology, but it was clear they thought of the technical people as not deeply germane to the main business. And around the same time as, as CD started to come out, there were, there were CD or animation for, for stories on CD ROMs, which meant that Microsoft had a, a group of artists, but they were second class and the technical people were first class. So you can see these two different class structures, but they were flipped and they were both wrong. Yeah. And so, and, and I was fortunate because I, at, at, at Lucasfilm, there actually was a stronger structure because they had these special effects, right. guys, but they were thought of as technical artists. And, and that, that's still the terminology that you see it's in wrong. the industry is the, the, these are technical artists. And for me, it's just a healthier way, but it's, it's delicate. You have to actually work on that balance and observe what's going on to make sure that it is balanced. So I, I, would, I would like to emphasize the equality of the art and the science, which I know that Pat and Ed and I all believe in. And Pat, you joined New York Institute of Technology Mm -hmm. A little bit later than that, but that's when we first met. Yes. And the other thing which is so dear to my heart, which is just at the very bottom of an educator, at the very top of an educator's soul, is the fact that if, if you want to stay active, if you want to stay alive, I've heard you say, just stay with the students. Yes. And, and I look at, at you, one of the stars of the entire computer graphics industry for so long in so many different aspects of the whole thing and see what you are doing today in your mid sixties. And I don't mean to embarrass <laughs> you, but you're the kid. I'm the youngster. You're the <laughs> youngster of a city. Yeah, exactly. And I ask what you are doing. You're saying, I'm starting with the fundamentals. Yeah. I'm asking the freshmen and sophomores to learn how to build an operating system or a system. Yeah. And most faculty, in order to get tenure today, have to work with the graduate students. Mm -hmm. And you're going in the other direction which I so greatly admire. Why? Why? Well, that's a good. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, well, I like to teach. I'm I'm not a very good teacher to be honest. I mean, I'm a so so teacher, but I like to teach. And I never thought I'd be a teacher. Actually, I mean, most people think of me as a researcher, but I've actually my profession is really a teacher. You know, and I get a lot of credit for what my students do, which is sort of embarrassing to me, but but I love teaching them and, you know, and I like teaching grad students. Well, I, I hope to graduate about 50 grad students. I'm almost done. I'm almost ready to retire. But I, I guess why I, I decided when I came back from a sabbatical that I wanted to teach freshmen and sophomores. I mean, partly because, you know, they, they haven't been, uh, you know, they haven't, their minds have not been polluted or whatever. I mean, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're exploring and they don't know much about computing. The other thing is a little bit about myself. I mean, since I was in biophysics, uh, I had you teach myself computer science. So I uh, had you, I had, was very much curiosity driven. And I sort of did it by just learning how things worked, you know, learning how computers worked and learning how programs are written and how compilers worked. And I, I just had you learn all the fundamentals myself. And I, I sort of did it from the bottom up. I sort of like, you know, I did, I learned about new ideas as I needed them. And I basically was doing that because actually I was aware of your work 
and I was at the University of Wisconsin, and I had to sort of teach myself computer graphics, and I did it by reading SIGGRAPH. So SIGGRAPH keeps coming back into the story, reading the SIGGRAPH proceedings and then writing programs, you know, in that were, you know, implementing algorithms that were describing how to make pictures. And so I just gradually learned about computing sort of from this bottom up. And it was just, you know, I was driven. I mean, computing, actually, I was very bored with computers initially. Now I'm fascinated with them. But I, I did, I took one computer science course in my life. I thought it was the most boring course I ever done. <laughs> but I taught my, I was driven by making pictures, you know, and I just learned what I needed sort of bottom up based on curiosity. So I try to impart that to the freshmen. I want, I, I want them, I'm a very pragmatic about them. I, I want them to figure out some things to do that they really want to do with computers. I want to teach them how they work. Cause I think if you know how things work, fundamentally, you can make breakthroughs. That's just a philosophical belief of mine. And then I want them to get skilled at the tools. I mean, I think people don't often emphasize the skills you need um, to do stuff, whether it's math or art or drawing or whatever. So yeah, so I, I love that. And, you know, it's fun to sort of see them go over the edge, you know, get, you know, they just get to some point where they can feel comfortable with the technology and they can start building stuff making doing what they want and so I I find that really fun and uh, you know they're so enthusiastic and smart it's just invigorating yeah. but, but but you just said something which is so important for the future of education because if I were to ask you the question what skills should you have we we may not have time in this hour <laughs> yeah. for you for you to finish the number of disciplines that you have to talk about. Yeah, yeah. There's well, it's a very interdisciplinary world these days. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to have the curiosity. You know, I mean, you you uh, you know, you need. You're not going to learn everything in school. I guarantee you that. I, I you know, I did not know any computer science. I did not think computer science. You know, you just have to have curiosity. You know, in my life, I've worked in physics. I've worked in you know, now I'm doing a lot of work in programming languages, I'm building hardware, I've, I've done a lot of work in visualization, you know, worked at artistic places, worked on 3D modeling systems, worked, I wrote the animation system at NYIT. I mean, you know, I just, I'm just curious, I think I am curious, you know, and I think if, if you sort of feel, you get your, sort of get some traction where you can learn how to learn and have confidence in that you can learn stuff when you need it, that that's the most important thing to, to learn in school. I mean, you need some background, but I don't try to give them a complete set of skills because I don't think, you know, it's possible. Uh, I do tend to like to emphasize the fundamentals because I do think the fundamentals tend to be the things that stick around the longest, you know? I mean, that's why they're called fundamentals. So I tend to always, like, like when I teach a graduate course in computer graphics, I never read SIGGRAPH papers. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I read, I read the books <laughs> behind the SIGGRAPH papers. You know, like if you want to teach rendering, read a book on Monte Carlo, right? Or radiative heat transfer or, or whatever. If you want to, you know, teach a course on geometry, learn about differential geometry, you know. So you, you, you then, you know, the graphics, you know, the other thing is, is you, you sort of have a certain set of skills. You mostly want to learn about the things you don't know. So if you're a computer science student, you know how to program and you know how to design algorithms, but you might not know about differential geometry, you know. So that's a sort of a curiosity driven thing. Uh, but I think that's what we need to uh, teach people. And back to Ed's point, I mean, you have to teach people to appreciate the diversity of the kinds of people you're going to work with in the future. I mean, um, you know, I at NYT, I was amazed we had all these artists there. And uh, they were so fun to work with. I mean, I couldn't imagine you know, doing what we did without the artists there. And I think they enjoyed us. We were mutually stimulated. I mean, people, diversity, I, I really, you know, we, I hope everybody believes in diversity like I do, but it just creates this rich environment with these different viewpoints and these different skills and these different cultural backgrounds. And that's where innovation and creativity comes from is by, because no single person, you know, knows everything you need to do to make a great movie, for example. So uh, yeah, so I uh, yeah, so you have to appreciate diversity, and I think that is one problem right now in a lot of education is people get very specialized very quickly and isolated from different people. Like artists, like at Pixar, 
the animators and the artists were mixed up with the technical people, but I don't think they're mixed up at Stafford. You know, School of Engineering is on one side of the campus, the art department's on the other side of the campus. They're not taking classes together. And so I think we really need to, you know, mix people up so that they appreciate, because they, they, if they don't appreciate that the other people bring value, you know, if you don't, you're not gonna become, I'm never gonna be a great artist, but I appreciate what they do. And, and I appreciate that they look at the world differently than I do. And so that's mostly what I need is I don't wanna treat them as a second class. I wanna appreciate that they're a person doing really interesting stuff. So I hope, I hope we do that in education as well. It's, uh, it's I, I'm still in awe <laughs> of the number of disciplines you were able to master and you were being very humble well, uh, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. I, I think I am curious. Uh, but it, I love the fact that you're curious. I'm curious. And yeah. I think that's just fantastic to the students. I'm still an educator at heart and in full admission to my biases and so on. <laughs> Maybe the one record I have at Cornell University is I was its first unclassified student. <laughs> they didn't know how to mix my interest in art and in science. Mm -hmm. let, let me shift a little bit and uh, to a, a subject which I think is, is really important. And, and that is the uh, exponential growth in the industry that we all got together with in the 1970s when SIGGRAPH was started. And I think both Pat and Ed and myself would say that our closest academic friends are still the ones that we met and contributed to the advances of the field of computer graphics, which was built on the scientists of centuries before, the Maxwells and the Newtons and the mathematicians and so on. And that is we've witnessed an exponential growth, which is so far greater than we expected that uh, any of our predictions, if we tried to make them, repeat them what they were in the 1970s, we were too conservative. <laughs> we, we couldn't believe it. And I, I would like to show this one more picture. You can see, because I, I lucked out. That is a picture of the lunar landing vehicle docking with the Apollo mother spacecraft. And it was done at General Electric Simulation Laboratory where they were training uh, the astronauts how to dock those two vehicles in space. And it was run by Rod Ruzolo and Bob Schumacher, who then joined Evans and Sutherland uh, at Utah. And we had the capabilities to be able to render 64 polygons in real time, which meant 30 seconds, 30 frames per second, provided that we did the computation for the shading on those polygons in advance. And that's what got me started with 14 architects, many of whom went on to become famous in the computer graphics community and who taught the three of us to understand the stuff that could be done now so there are a lot of students who deserve that credit all the way through. Uh, I don't think it's fair to run through all of the names, but I would like to acknowledge that from the three of us and more from what we learned from those students. So looking at that, it's understandable why people would say that, well, animation, that's an absolutely ridiculous thing to be doing we will never be able to uh, do that. But we have exponential growth. And exponential growth means that today, computing is basically free. Now, is that really true? Well, maybe not quite, 
but it has enabled the change in a lot of other disciplines. And I wonder if both of you could comment on how in fact the convergence of those disciplines with the exponential power that has happened has changed, not that was intended to start with computer graphics, but I remember giving a talk at a former uh, SIGGRAPH conference of, of where really techniques in search of a problem. So what are the problems? Uh, which one of you would like to well, talk yeah. first? Well, so, well, a couple of things in exponential growth. The, the, the one that we usually refer to is Moore's law, which had a lifetime that was far greater than anybody would have guessed when it was first posited. Um, and I, the one thing I've come to appreciate is that um, <clears throat> the, um, the, the when something changes by an order of magnitude, our ability to predict the results goes way down. <laughs> All right. So now, that is a <clears throat> classic. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that so, so basically exponential just compound growth. So it's getting, you know, 40% faster, whatever, every single year. So you've got many orders of magnitude. So our ability to predict not only was way off, we didn't predict how long it could continue on this path. But the other thing, which I think is under, underappreciated, is that Moore's law is an example of one of the exponential processes. That's right. That in fact, there are multiple ones. Each one have different rates of growth, different rates at which they run out of energy, um, they, uh, and, and different exponents with them. So on, on top of Moore's law, well, what's Moore's law? Moore's law is a result of people in several disciplines figuring out how to make things smaller, how to see things, how to figure out how you do the masking, the miniaturization, going down from this you know, sort of big level, like you, you were showing the cores, <laughs> the core memories, which were really little cores, <laughs> um, all the way to figuring out what the, uh, how you have uh, uh, these, uh, uh, an array of transistors and getting smaller and smaller, all driven by the fact that it is useful so their economics, which means people are paying for advances in the engineering. So the sizes, the speeds, the energy, all these things happen simultaneously. And it's complicated. So how in the world can we possibly predict what the future is gonna be when it's just chaotic? We have exponential forces that are going on. We also have uh, some very nonlinear things. We have uh, accidents and, and uh, um, um, you know, stuff that's just unknown that we can't even conceive of. It's pretty rich. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's happening there. <laughs> and what it does is it enables to be exciting, but, but it also means that we can't repeat what we did. So that's the notion of like, okay, we're, let's, we've got this. We got, we, we got it. Let's, you know, let's hang on to this. It doesn't work that way. We cannot repeat what we did. And as much as I love a lot of these things that happened in the past, they already happened. So what's going forward now is gonna be different. And there are still exponential forces at play. You clearly see it with the internet, with the That's amount right. of data, um, and now with uh, neural networks also coming out of the basement. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, you've got other exponential forces at play affecting everything else. Not stopping. Yeah. So a couple of points. I mean, one thing I, I just want to, you know, give Ed credit. One of the things when I arrived at, at Pixar was just realizing how they were tracking Moore's law and how patient they were. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm this young kid and I want to make a picture movie tomorrow or whatever. And, you know, it it took, what do you, you say, 20 years roughly? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to, to invest, you know, you talk about visionary. I mean, to, to work on a project that has a 20 year, you know, you know a period, wait, gestation period, and to just make continual progress and be productive and survive 
over 20 years. And, you know, Ed, you deserve a lot of credit for both. And, and almost pretty much nailing the timing. I mean, talk about prediction, you know, almost nailing the timing about when it would be possible, you know. Um, uh, so I, I think that's really quite remarkable that you, that you were able to do that. And Alvi as well, I think it was really interested into that problem as well. So uh, anyway, that's interesting. That's a unique skill that, that he had. And, you know, I would not be here if, if they didn't get that 20 years to work on the technology. The, the, sec the second just thing about the different rates, you know, it's a really, that's really, you got to like drill into these things a little bit. Um, you know, one, I worked a lot on GPUs and one of the reasons I got excited about that, well, first it was just, it was obvious we needed unlimited computing power for, for graphics. Actually, one, one interesting thing about graphics is, you know, we, we knew Moore's law was, was in action. So if we made a picture and it took like 20 hours, we could just predict exactly <laughs> when that would be done in real time. You know what I mean? Because, you know, we'd need a factor of 10,000 and that would be, you know, a 20 years or something like that. So we, you know, Frank Crow made these great graphs where he would plot how many uh, operations went into different pictures when they were first uh, created, like the teddy bear picture, radi <laughs> radiosity and so what, on. What is a text? Yeah, and, and exactly. And then, and then we would, and then you just, he would draw this and then he would have two lines, you know, one line where you have so much computing power, another line where you have a different amount of computing power. And when they intersected those curves, that's when it was real time. And then he had, you know, he would he'd label the axis like fanatical. That means, you know, you spend 24 hours making one picture and then, you know, you know, 60 hertz is at the other extreme, you know, and there's everything in between. So, you know, you can predict the future and in rendering, we were, we were quite, quite good at predicting the future. There's some, there's some big, you know, um, sort of uh, bumps in the road as you try to go towards real time sometimes. But, um, but anyway, that's interesting. But anyways, back to the rate thing. Uh, the, you, look, you have to look at these rates very carefully. And so the reason I got interested in GPUs uh, was, well, I was always interested in them, I guess, but the, when I really noticed something big was happening was Moore's law was actually a law about how many transistors were put on the chip. chip. And it turned out that that was like doubling every two years, but, but, the, um, but the processor speeds were not doubling nearly as fast. So they, so we we would we would actually the way we said is we called it the number of transistors is the capability. So that is sort of like how much compute low level compute. It's like how much they, how many joules you have and something. You know how many how many switching operations can you do? And then you had how fast you could run a C program. And those two rates were different. You know I mean you know the the CPUs were just really inefficient. And by the way. If you, if you take that little 25% and you extrapolate that over 10 years, now you're talking about huge numbers, you know? So these CPUs were just unbelievably inefficient compared to the amount of resources that were being devoted to them. And, you know, it's just an example of how you have to think about exponentials. Uh, you know, I was happened to be fortunate to be around some great Harvard people like Bill Daly, who's now at NVIDIA and Mark Horowitz and, and so on. And they explained this to me. And uh, you know that got me a lot more excited about GPUs, and I just knew, yeah, it was sort of obvious that you could put you know teraflops on a chip, and you know one of these Intel chips was not going to run a teraflop. So it 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 just you know it, it became a challenge. Now, how do you you know convert? You know, it, it was a design challenge. How do you take advantage of all your resources? It's an engineering challenge, and it was a really fun challenge. But it was based on a calculation on rates. So I think I think there it's very hard. I think Ed, it, you know, sort of instilled that into me, where you just have to be really aware of these big trends. And when you when you work on something, you have to work on the immediate thing, but you also have to sometimes be patient. You have to really think through these exponentials, and then you can invest in things and start working on things before other people are willing to do it. You know, a lot of people won't wait 20 years. <laughs> I mean, I'm a very patient person. <laughs> I can wait 20 years uh, uh, before I get some reward, but, um, but you know, you have to be patient sometimes. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> disadvantages of patience is that <laughs> that by the time you get there, it's 20 years later and you're 20 years older. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> not nearly as much fun. Yeah. <laughs> but but there's, there's another thing which is, is related to this, um, because as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, graphics wasn't considered to be yeah. central, yeah. but 
over time, um, there's this the, the phenomenon of we, graphics grew in importance. People began to realize it. Uh, yeah. the, the next major company that came along was Silicon Graphics, uh, founded by Jim Clark. Jim, unfortunately, left. <laughs> and at some point uh, uh, after he left, Silicon Graphics uh, went away and the engineers then dispersed. And out of the number of companies that came out of that, one was NVIDIA. But then a dynamic happened, and most people didn't understand this, and, and you were re referring to this, Pat, which was that they were then focusing on trying to get a lot of specialized computing on these chips, which became GPUs. But what was really amazing is that there were three parts to this other exponential cycle. One of them was that the algorithms for making imagery we're coming out of SIGGRAPH, out of this academic community, which freely published. That's the great thing about SIGGRAPH. It's, it's really open and people were sharing. I love that yeah, about it's it. It's still happening. It's still yeah. happening. It's great. And then these, so, so NVIDIA was the best at this. So they participate. They're participants in this community, getting the ideas coming from all over the place, from academia, and they would put them into the chips and they had a, an aggressive learning style, which was they release a new graphics chip every six months. If something wasn't working, they just seal it off, but they were gonna ship the chip, but it sold into the games industry. So this was just this gigantic industry. It's funding this because academia in no way is big enough, neither is entertainment like special effects or Pixar, big enough to justify any expenditure in hardware chips, all right? But the games industry was, so they're making these chips. So this is funding it. The chips then go into these boards, which we bring into academia and to, to special effects. And the people there would develop new algorithms because they had more processing power and they'd write papers to go into SIGGRAPH. So we had this, you know, another 10 to 20 year cycle of where the exponential growth rate of compute power for the GPUs was greater than it was for the CPUs. And so, you know, around 2004, 2005, like that, right. it's enough power that uh, neural networks, which is, was conceived of 50 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they then could then pick up because they had the power, plus another exponential thing that was happening, which was, the access of information over the internet, which is growing exponentially, uh, and these gigantic servers to compute. So you've got these different exponential things coming together, enabling something, but nobody intended this. That is, when they were making GPUs, they weren't thinking, oh, we're gonna enable uh, neural networks or deep learning. Yeah. So we, we've got three different groups causing this spiral with a completely unpredictable yeah. outcome, which is fundamentally changing the field of computer science. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. It is amazing. I mean, and, and you know, people, I, you know, for the SIGGRAPH community, people, I think people, one thing I've learned from just interviewing with people and so on, people really don't understand much about computer graphics and what we do and what we've done. And that's a good example because, you know, we were, I, I think the way I think of it is we just set out to solve these really challenging problems like making a movie. And it was a hugely challenging problem, required unbelievable number amount of resources. And in the process, you know, we, we and it was a large market for it, like that says, but we came up with these like fundamentally great computer science ideas, you know? I mean, you know, NVIDIA as a GPU company is, you know, worth more than Intel right now, right? So, I mean, we came up with, and, and, and the way we program these things, I mean, it's not just the art. I mean, it's also the systems work. I mean, I've done a lot of work in systems, just the systems work, you know, and domain specific languages and in architecture and, and everything about it. And, you know, so people in, you know, computer science don't never really appreciate it how fanatical we were and how we were not going to stop, you know. Actually, my favorite comment of, that I got when from people, I got lots of, you know, really thoughtful 
congratulatory notes. But my, my favorite comment was that, you know, computer graphics is the Rodney Dangerfield of computer science. <laughs> it gets no respect. <laughs> yeah, maybe not you don't remember Rodney Dangerfield, but go watch his uh, I get no respect video. But, you know, it, you know, we don't get the respect. We did, I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, grab too much honor, but I do think people in SIGGRAPH should be buoyed by the fact that you're making really fundamental contributions of computing. And I, I do think sometimes, you know, we, we, we don't always recognize we are, you know, because you, you, you know, you, you know, like, yeah, I, I really wish the first paper on using GPUs for neural nets would have appeared in SIGGRAPH. You well, know, I, I mean, that yeah. would have been wonderful. Yeah, it would have been wonderful. Exactly. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I go back to Frank Rosenblatt <laughs> yeah, and yeah, Perceptron. Yeah, okay? exactly. Yeah, no, we so, all learned that. We, uh, that was all and, like. And that came out of neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, also, and, one, I want to make one but, more comment, if I could, just based on what Ed said. But, you know, there's all these exponentials here. But I think one thing is we, the SIGGRAPH community created an exponential amount of algorithms and techniques <laughs> that went into making movies, you know? I mean, like people say, like, we're getting credit. Like, Ed and I are both, you know, humbled that we got this award. But when we think about what it takes to make a movie and what we actually, what the two of us actually did, you know, we're just this tiny little bit, you know what I mean? I mean, if you think of a movie, you know, looking outside here, we're at Ed's house, and by we're at Ed's house, which is beautiful in Tiburon, California, uh, it's a foggy day in San Francisco. But if I look outside, there's these hills out there, you know, there's these trees, there's all these plants, you know, there's this structure, this building, the modeling of the building, there's the clouds, the sky, the wind, there's us, there's the there's furniture, there's the cloth. There's everything you ever saw. Our, yeah, and you know, <laughs> I mean, how much of that did I work on? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, everybody in SIGGRAPH, I mean, it, it was a huge effort by, you know, I mean, SIGGRAPH used to have 50,000 people attending. It still is a huge, probably, it's still probably the largest ACM conference, but there were a lot of brilliant people working on all these algorithms in this period. And, you know, that's, that's why we were able to do it. You know, we, we are getting recognized for it, but, you know, our little, little tiny corner, you know, and it really is this, this massive effort by the community, the SIGGRAPH community, massive intellectual effort by not getting a lot of recognition in the early days or support, you know, a lot of financial support that we're able to create this incredible body of knowledge, this exponentially growing body of knowledge that let us make a movie. You know, I mean, I never thought we'd ever make a movie in my lifetime. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm talking too much, but I, I, you know, I thought it was, well, it's a Turing award and he had this Turing test. I thought making a movie would be like passing the <laughs> Turing test because how could you make something that was so believable, you know? And I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime that we would accumulate enough knowledge about how to do all that stuff that we would actually be able to make a, right. a picture like right. that. You know what I mean? So anyway, Kudos to the everybody at SIGGRAPH, and I know I'm extremely thankful that I got to participate with all of you. And I wish I was in person with all of you right now, but I wish, you know, thank you. I mean, we, we're getting more credit than we deserve. Everybody deserves credit here. I, I think that's a statement that's true for all of us mm -hmm. and all of the people who contributed to mm -hmm. that. And it's what I meant in the very beginning when I said that the impact of, of what we are doing is far greater than just making a movie. Mm -hmm. In fact, the entertainment industry might be the one segment which we would least expect yeah. to contribute to the intellectual. To this kind of groundbreaking of this, work, yeah. Mm -hmm. With the possible exception of games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which might have even been worse. And, and here it is, where it's the huge market, it's the best user interfaces that exist, and it's the most complex rendering capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to emphasize to some degree to the audience, and I uh, have to, uh, just recently I'm starting to work with NVIDIA very closely, uh, I take a look at the change 
of what has happened and what Ed was talking about with respect to the compounding of multiple segments of exponential growth from parallelism to pipelining to artificial intelligence to the size of the transistors, which NSF wouldn't fund any research in graphics lower than 250 nanometers or smaller than 250 nanometers when we formed that science and technology center. Mm -hmm. And now we're down at five nanometers yes. and going to three. And the wonderful cover on the ACM communications, which was a tombstone that's from Gordon, on Gordon Moore saying the prediction of my death has been greatly exaggerated <laughs> and so on. We have today, if we look at the chips, or, or not the chips, the graphics boards, which are available from NVIDIA, uh, we have in terms of the power of the instruction cycles, which can be operated, 500 million million that's a that's a, a quadrillion <laughs> right it's 10 to the 12 times as much power as we had with the first machines that i was showing you <laughs> okay. that is amazing. so what do you do with that and how can it impact our educational system which i think is very important and why is it that we are still educating our people in silos where we're not doing what the Pat Hanrahan did of being curious about everything, or as Ed described before, the convergence. And I'm very frustrated <laughs> about that. We, you know, just one second for one more, because I, I, I'm still teaching. And maybe I shouldn't be teaching, but I can't leave the classroom. I, I will have addiction problems <laughs> if I uh, do that. Why? <laughs> I'll have, they'll have a nice stretcher for you. <laughs> by, by, why, the way, by the way, we only have uh, about five minutes left. Why is it that we are still teaching in silos? And it has been rumored that uh, changing a curriculum at a university today is a little more difficult than moving a graveyard. <laughs> That's good. By the way, we have about so five minutes. How do we do? Actually, but I also want to just interject because you asked me to keep track of the time. Thank we have you. a little yeah. bit more than five minutes. I'm only through half my questions. Oh, I know, but I wonder, <laughs> we do have some questions. So I wonder if... Will you be willing to uh, of course. have somebody I'll, I'll, else ask? I mean, not that you don't ask great questions, but I want, Andres, are, are you monitoring the questions or? Yeah, the are there, questions you are think the you Zoom chat. Yeah, do, do you think of- Should I, I, I read one? You want to, if you think there's a good one, yeah. There, or what, I'm sure there's a good one. So, uh, what do you envision the future of computer graphics will be in 20 years? What challenges do you anticipate? That's, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's my last question. Thank you. <laughs> I'll let Ed go with that. Okay, so I do have an opinion on that. Incidentally, <laughs> not everything is exponential. Um, so it's actually, they're all mixed together and certain things actually go backwards. And there's also such things exponential decay. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's, there is resistance. Uh, one of the, when I was an undergraduate, I was studying physics and I, I wanted to be at the frontier, but I knew that getting to the frontier in physics was a long ways off. It was hard to get there, but I was, computer science was brand new. And I realized we were at the frontier. It was like being at the Easter egg hunt where they just cut the <laughs> ribbon and they're right in front of you. So this is, this is cool. But I remember that feeling of being at the frontier. What's really cool about computer science, so now it's 50 years later, we're still at the frontier. Right. That is these things that are happening, like uh, combining the, the, what, what you get with the machine learning, which is, I mean, I forget the, the word artificial intelligence, but in terms of, of, of analyzing and pattern recognition beyond what we can do, 
All right, it's pretty amazing. And now it's gonna be applied to different areas. So we've got none of the more compute power, we've got other exponential things going on. We've got the this period of time, we don't know how long it's gonna last, but there's a period of time when which there's this rapid growth, which is gonna affect numerous fields. That's right. That's exciting. I don't even know what it's gonna do. But what a cool place to be. Uh, and it's now. And, uh, right? It's not talking about the past, it's what we've got right now. Uh, We're at the frontier. I, I mean, I think two areas that are really neat are, I mean, I actually think, you know, right now we very laboriously craft these movies. You know, I think artificial intelligence and machine learning will like make the world more autonomous, more independent. You know, I, I just would love to just go into some virtual world that whatever, you know, or a virtual living thing or a virtual planet or whatever. And just have the animals being walking around on their own and, and stuff like that, you know, or the plants. I mean, so anyway, I, I believe that we could really uh, go one giant step forward. And I think there's been a lot of great work on using reinforcement learning to, to much time character animation. The, the, other, the other one I'm really hot on is just, you know, to me, one of the great joys is actually digital photography, which our communities worked on a lot. And that's that's like permeated everybody's lives, and that you know that, I mean there's certain kind of high end creativity like they do at Pixar, and that that's a cultural thing, right? You know that that creates our our culture which we all share. But then there's this personal creativity, and right. you know when I see what the cameras on phones have done, you know, uh, um, you know in terms of you know we we were all, we've been commenting we don't have a, pic, a lot of pictures of us at Pixar, you know. Um, so, you know, now these pictures are just coming out and people are taking unbelievable pictures and they're being assisted yeah. by the technology in unbelievable ways and taking pictures in low light and sports. But anyway, I, I just feel that we could, as a field, continue to try to make uh, the technology a, appeal to individuals. Because I think art is very personal. You know, to, I, I tend to think of art as about personal expression. And so, I mean, there's, it's one thing to have a, a, a huge crew of a thousand people produce something. Sometimes you need to do that. But, you know, to me, the, you know, most of the famous art we see is made by individuals because they have a very unique point of view and they want to express themselves. So, so could I add one statement before we have to sign off? Because yes, I'm, I'm the old, old man <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> And, uh, but the three of us are still old enough that when we went through school, we were taught how to do something. And then we were given exams and we were judged how well we were able to show that we understood the processes that we were taught. And so there was a judgment from faculty to students and that's the way education was. And I think that the availability of this exponential growth of capabilities will enlarge the creativity of the individual. And we will change from trying to judge students on whether they understand something with the questions which we ask to how can we train the students and the future uh, students, and particularly the people in the graphics community, to ask the right questions, which mm -hmm. we now have the capabilities to possibly answer with all the tools in which you were taken. And from a personal point of view, I want to tell you, I, I, I can't have more joy. <laughs> My heart will burst. And being part of the discussion with the two guys who have basically legitimatized the field of computer science uh, or computer graphics in computer science for the future. And I wanna thank SIGGRAPH and Pat and Ed for the opportunity to participate in it. And all of the students who have helped educate the three of us. <laughs> and That's for sure. uh, with that, uh, Unless you have other well, just to, to reinforce that, you know, <laughs> past from the sixties, I'm mid fifties, and you're the, you're, I'm excuse me, mid seventies. <laughs> you're the mid fifties. <laughs> but as it's the 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 home has been, even though I'm in the entertainment world a lot, my friends basically are largely 
in the computer graphics community in SIGGRAPH. Yeah. And I have such incredible gratitude for all those years and the, the friends and the, the knowledge and the experience of that. It's, it's made everything to me. Yeah. Perfect. This is a perfect way to conclude. Thank you very much again. This has been a fantastic panel. Uh, great content and the reactions of the community in the um, Discord channel are amazing. Thank you very much again for your time and your ideas. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good Bye, conference. Bye, everyone. Be good. <laughs>